Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is a Tektronix THT P0200, and it's a combination of a high voltage probe with a fairly high frequency, considering how high the voltage input is. So you can take 1500 volts peak maximum between these two terminals. It's quite nice, and it is a 200 megahertz probe. So you can imagine that combination opens up some pretty high frequency power supply analysis and some high voltages. So it has a pretty good use case. Now this does have a Take VPI interface, and it can bring up the menu by pressing this button. These things are still fairly expensive. Now this has a very unusual problem. Let me plug it into the instrument so we can see what it does. So look what happens when I plug it into any of the Tektronix scopes. This is a 4 series that I've plugged it into, but you can see that it says that the probe model number is THTP0100, which is of course incorrect. There is actually a probe with that number. It's the different version of the same family, but this is not it. And then eventually the communication times out and the scope recovers. It's actually frozen for some time before it gets into this point. It basically says that the communication has failed. Now these probes have some pretty sophisticated uh, microprocessors, controllers built into them, and they do the communication to the scope. We'll talk about that interface in just a second, and obviously something's gone wrong with that. So either the firmware is corrupted or something's wrong with the I.O., we're going to go ahead and measure this, try and figure out if that's correct. Now this also does report a serial number. Let me see if that serial number is correct. So the serial number that's ri written on the probe is C022213. So that is correct. So it does return the correct serial number, just, try, just the wrong model number. So let's take a look at it. So here's the front end of the probe. Now this doesn't do any of the high voltage magic, of course. That's all done in the other part of the probe. And the interface with that is the RF interface and a couple of wires here for providing power and some communication. Now there's two metal shields protecting everything here. We'll take those off. Here are the pogo pins that interface directly to the front of the instrument. I should be able to take this off, I think. Let's see what's underneath here. What do we have? There we go. There's our microprocessor there. That's going to do all the communication. So that interface, the model number, serial number, all of that is embedded in this. So we're going to have to take a look and see if there is a way to access that. Now there does seem to be a programming port. This ribbon over here was connected to the front end buttons, like so. So I just disconnected that. Now I'm going to remove this part as well. I'm just going to unsolder this ground cable from this chassis so we can focus only on this. And I'm going to press this in against the instrument and see what it does. I mean, this is going to be missing, but let's see if when everything is removed, this actually reports anything correctly. And then we're going to have to spy on these channels and see what is going on between this guy and the instrument itself to find out if there is something wrong with the, let's say, the logic levels or something in terms of the communication. We can also x-ray this just to see the traces so we can really reverse engineer the schematic. So let's go do that. So I've made some new discoveries that I want to share with you. I'm actually returning back to this project after some time. So as you can see, I've rebuilt the probe front end. And the reason is because I found a cut in the coaxial cable that connects the cable to the front end BNC. And this wouldn't have worked even if the probe was functional otherwise, because that was creating a short circuit anyway. So that was the first thing that needed to be worked. And I had to rebuild this entire front end, cut the cable, resolder everything, you know, shrink tube everything to make sure it's all nice and solid. That interface is pretty important as well as the grounding. And then I went ahead and I extracted the firmware that was on the microprocessor here. And I took a look at it and it led me to believe that the problem is not here. And I'll show you why once we take a look at the firmware. Now if you look, there are four wires in here. That's how this probe head communicates to the probe body. And the probe body is where all the range switches and relays and smart controls are, which means that there must be another microprocessor inside the probe body itself, because this four wires is simply not enough to do all the configurations and talk to the buttons. So this is a two processor system. So if the problem is not with the firmware in here, it must be with the firmware in the body itself. Now I spoke with Ilya from XDEF, who was very kind and went ahead and downloaded the firmware from his own probe and shared it with me. Now he doesn't have the same model, he has the 100 model, but he grabbed all the firmware from them and that's what led me to be able to compare them and make some conclusions, which we will talk about. So let's put this aside for a second. Let's take a look at the probe body. Let's see what's inside and how it's made, and then I'll show you the issues with the firmware. So Pooch, what is your opinion on the probe problem? You think we're going to be able to fix it? Pooch, are you paying attention to me? Good cat. And here is what's inside the probe body. Now if you think about this at an abstract level, all this is supposed to do is to take the high voltage input, isolate it, 
attenuate it to a point where it can be processed with classic op amps at the reasonable voltage level and then pass that to the input of the actual oscilloscope because this does no digitization the signal is still processed entirely by the oscilloscope itself it's a reconditioning block more than anything else so the input coming over here then we have some cutouts in the pcb and protection these are again there to make sure that nothing arcs over in case the user makes some mistakes and put a very high voltage in we have resistors and capacitors in there surface mount to divide everything down and the differential signal ultimately reaches a transformer fader isolating everything jumps over across some reconditioning capacitors and resistors again and then goes into the op amp circuits on the other side we have varactors that you can tune and potentiometers to get rid of various offsets and common mode adjustments and gain adjustments and so on some relays again for range switching and that's about it and then that signal eventually ends up in the coaxial cable over here there's some power supply conditioning again as well because you need to bring the power supply voltages up or down depending on what's running and here is another microprocessor so basically the serial data coming over here communicates with this guy and this guy then controls all the relays and everything else in order to make sure that you set the range and so on and this also has buttons that you can press so of course that needs to also be processed and is read by another ribbon cable from the front end so that's really all that's going on now this microprocessor here also has a port here which is exactly the same pinout which we can read from so let's take a look and see what these firmwares actually look like and what happens when we put in a new firmware into this chip so on xdev.com Ilya has updated the website includes the pictures of what it looks like inside of his probe as well as the connection you need to make in order to program it he's really a master of documentation I mean it's incredible how much effort he can put into something so quickly and create these nice diagrams so this allowed me to basically extract the firmware of my probe and he also extracted the firmware of his probe and allowed me to do some comparison so let's take a look and see what we have so here is what is the firmware inside of the probe head this is the part of the probe that connects directly to the oscilloscope now if you look at this on the right side you can see from the ASCII interpretation that all the probe models are already listed so the THDP 100, the MDP 200 and the THDP 200 are all listed this means that the probe is common between all of those models these are all the models that Tektronic currently offers and it means that the probe body itself must identify itself as the particular model and then the probe have just simply uh, in informs the scope which one is connected and I also compared the firmware of mine versus Ilya's probe and they were identical so there's no firmware corruption in the probe head now what about the EEPROM part of it well we can also download that and the EEPROM inside of my probe has my serial number in it you can see this is exactly what the serial number was and this is what we saw when we connected it to the oscilloscope now, in Ilya's probe is exactly the same except the serial number is different so that also makes sense so the only difference between the two EEPROMs is the serial number and nothing else that means that we need to pay attention to the probe body that's where the error most likely is so when I went ahead and extracted that firmware as well and Ilya did the same now his probe was the 100 model and mine is a 200 model so they're not the same nonetheless we extracted it and I did some comparison on that as well let me see where I put that here we go so the original flash body of his and mine were also identical which means that the flash content of the probe body even though the model is different are exactly the same yet again so that must be that that's not the problem neither now the only thing that is left is just the EEPROM of the body and I went ahead and compared that and there is where we see some more differences now there is no more serial number in this and you can see that the probe that he has sent me and my probe have very different first line content of their EEPROM now I have no way of knowing what this means I put this into and the ASCII interpretation makes no sense it doesn't really mean anything it's just gibberish now the probe is using this information to do something I just don't know what so the only thing I need to do at least to try it out is to download this one into my probe and see what happens if you see if it boots correctly or if it identifies itself as the 100 model or not let's go ahead and try that and see what we get okay well there's only one thing to try let's go ahead and plug it in and see what happens okay oh I heard some clicking oh wow wait a second okay it didn't complain anymore that's interesting let's see what does it say <laughs> what it detects the right probe now I'm really confused because remember we downloaded the EEPROM of the THDP0100 not the 200 but now it's detecting the correct probe this is very interesting that means that the EEPROM must be completely corrupted and it must have another way of knowing what probe model it has maybe it uses a combination of resistors on the actual printed circuit board 
if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because this way they will only have to download one firmware in all the probe models, both in the body and the PCB. And they just perhaps populate a different resistor in a different location to tell the microprocessor on the probe body which one is being selected. This is very interesting. Well, I guess there's only one thing to do. We have to try and, and test it to see if it's actually working or not now. Now, this obviously has a huge offset here. I don't know if that's stored anywhere in the actual EEPROM as a starting point, but let me auto-zero this and see what happens. There you go. It auto-zeroed. That's great. So we're looking at a very, very small signal. Remember, this is now a 150 volt signal. Should be So I should be able to adjust this. And then what do we see here? There we go. I can keep going. Yep, 600. There it is, 1.5 kilovolt. So it's sitting in the 1.5 kilovolt range. Uh, let me make sure that's actually correct. If I go into probe setup, yeah, it is 1.5 kilovolt. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. So it all works out. So let's connect some signal to it. And here's our test setup. We're going to use the GW Instec APS1102 as our AC source. We're going to apply a 500 hertz source from here, and it can go up to 200 volt RMS and maybe a little bit above that. So we're going to use that. And then, of course, it's directly connected to the probe, nothing unusual. And then it goes into our tech scope. So let's take a look and see if it measures anything correctly. All right, let's give it a try. So I have the GW Instec set to 10 volt RMS. So we're going to start slow and with a sm small amplitude here. I'm going to enable this. And let's see what we have. There you go. That looks pretty good. And the waveform looks nice. So we have 29 volt peak to peak and 9.8 volt RMS being measured. It's probably hard to read for you, but it's right over there. And the GW Instec actually is reports its own internal readout with 9.8 volt RMS. So this is all consistent, which is very nice. Let's go ahead and increase that. Series 20. Oops, now we're clipping, of course. Let's go to here, maybe one smaller. There we go. So that's 20, looks good. 40, 50, 49.13. Wow, it's really good. 70, 80, 90, and 100. Okay, looks good so far. Uh, I always go the wrong way. There you go. I'm going to crank it up as much as it can go. And we can go, here's 250. You can keep going. That's it, 280. That's the maximum. And we're reading 278 volt RMS. And the instrument is rep reporting 277.3, which is pretty close. I, I'm not sure what the tolerance is of the GW Instec is. But this is a 792 volt peak-to-peak -peak signal. And it's measuring it exactly correctly looks good and you can also see what a nice waveform the GW Instec actually creates at 500 Hertz at this amplitude it can also do other kinds of waveforms of course so I gotta say I'm pretty pretty happy with this uh, let's see if you can change the type of waveform you can also do a square wave square wave is going to be interesting there we go it's making some horrible noises as all the harmonics that can actually coming out of the instrument now there it is it is a square wave looks good let me change that before it drives me crazy back to sinusoid so honestly i think the probe works and that was such an interesting and unusual problem with the eprom and the fact that the eprom from the 100 model is detecting the correct probe and remember the attenuations are all different so if this was still wrong it wouldn't have worked like this so i think everything looks good and i think my conclusion that something on the pcb must be populated in such a way to tell the microcontroller which model it is is probably the right approach well, I hope that you liked this video. Let me know in the comment section what you think about this issue. And if you have this similar probe, thanks to Ilya, he has the firmers on his website now. The link is in the description. You can also grab it from there. I'll see you next time.